Je vous laisse, je vous laisse la parole. Merci. Euh, je voudrais remercier les, les organisatrices du, du colloque pour l'invitation de parler aujourd'hui ici. Euh, je vais faire ma présentation en anglais. Euh, je trouve toujours un peu drôle, un peu bizarre de parler en, en anglais en France, mais j'ai préparé ma présentation en, en, en anglais. Mais si vous voulez poser des questions en français à la fin, au, au débat, c'est parfait. Euh, Ségolène a, a parlé de, euh, a parlé de, de l'importance de, de l'éthique euh, aux états unis et particulièrement de, de l'éthique postcoloniale. Euh, ce que je veux faire euh, ici, c'est euh, en certaine manière de euh, critiquer euh, l'éthique euh, postcoloniale euh, d'un point de vue euh, plus euh, politique. Um, ethics has abandoned uh, its niche uh, status to become a shared concern across archaeology in most countries, especially in North America and Northern Europe. The appraisal of the socio-political context of, archaeolo of archaeological practice The appraisal of the socio-political context of archaeological practice since the 1980s has forced the discipline to take issue with the expanding array of ethical questions raised by work, uh, by, uh, work with living people. Thus, the original focus on the archaeological record, conservation, and um, scientific standards, which uh, were behind most the ontological codes of the 1980s and 1990s, has been largely transcended and even challenged. New concerns are related to archaeology's greater involvement with contemporary communities, political controversies, and social demands, including ethical responses to the indigenous critique, the benefits and risks of applied archaeology, the responsibilities of archaeologists in conflict and post-conflict situations, uh, vernacular digging and collecting practices, which are usually glossed over as looting, rescue archaeology or preventive archaeology, as it is usually known in France, heritage and the ethics of things, or post-anthropocentric ethics. Um, ethics have been playing an increasingly prominent role in archaeology since the mid-1980s. And the notion of rupture um, is useful here to understand why this is happening. When a rupture occurs, that is when we face a situation in which we cannot uh, um, behave as, as we used to, uh, then we are forced to change our paradigm. And this works for scientific paradigms, but it also works for ethics. So as soon as archaeologists started addressing the socio-political context in which their research was carried out in the 1980s, especially in the Anglo-Saxon countries in the framework of post-processual archaeology, uh, they started to, uh, uh, they, they were forced to take living people uh, into account and they had to expand the scope of archaeological ethics from mere objects to human beings. The ethical rupture of the 1980s then uh, has to be understood in relation to three wider phenomena that I think are very interesting and are usually not properly uh, appraised. This is first the spread of the participatory, participatory paradigm in Western liberal democracy. So you cannot just uh, have uh, experts lecturing the people, but you have to involve people in your research, you have to involve people in producing knowledge, but also in politics, in a more active way, beyond voting. <laughs> the second is that uh, uh, since the 1970s, we entered a new phase, uh, a new uh, phase in the cultural politics of capitalism that is characterized by multiculturalism. And finally, the third point that is important to understand this uh, shift in the ethical paradigm in archaeology 
is the rising status of victimhood in Western political and juridical thought. This is something that started after the Second World War, but it has been during the last 40 years where uh, victims have become perhaps one of the most important uh, problems and one of the most important phenomena in discussions on ethics. So uh, it is not surprising that the ethical discussion took a clear political angle in the beginning and this was the case with the founding of the World Archaeological Congress in 1986 as a reaction to the apartheid regime in South Africa. Ethical discussions concerned with politics uh, address issues of authority, of power, discourse, and legitimacy, and have been developed as part of indigenous Marxist, feminist, and decolonial archaeologists. Yet yeah, this political angle was somewhat lost during the 1990s. And ethics have been recently accused of depoliticizing the discipline. In fact, most of the uh, issues that are discussed in ethical debates could also be framed in political terms. And this uh, is valid for publication, standards of practice, contract archaeology, that is also very practical things can be uh, also understood from the point of view of, of politics and not necessarily ethics. Um, but in fact, a large part of the debate in ethics in archaeology that has developed during the last 10 or 15 years could be uh, uh, conceptualized better as politics than as ethics. And that's the case, for example, when we discuss issues of equality, enfranchisement, conflict, power symmetries, social justice, political economy, or capitalism in general. So I think that we should be asking, why have we decided to talk about ethics instead of politics? For me, the choice of the term is not innocent, and it can be linked to the neoliberal abhorrence of true agonistic politics. Ethics look like a much safer concept due to its association with morals, with virtuous behavior, and with policy, that is, with management, which is a very apolitical thing, or it looks very apolitical. Uh, the concept of ethics also accommodates very well the politics of identity that have occupied most of the space of politics in recent years, that is, the politics that are related to uh, gender, sexual, racial, ethnic, national, and so on, identities. So it is not surprising that some of the more uh, radical commentators in the field of archaeological ethics prefer to talk of after ethics. So what comes after ethics? We have been talking about ethics for 30 years, so uh, we have to go beyond ethics now. Or in other cases, as with uh, Yanis Hamilakis, uh, maybe we should better talk about political ethics to deal with some of the more relevant and pressing debates in archaeology today. So in the remainder of this talk, I would like to explore briefly archaeological ethics by focusing on the colonial and indigenous archaeologists and the challenges that they uh, uh, rise. Ethics in archaeology largely emerged, in fact, as a response to the uh, multicultural challenge in the 1980s. Indigenous peoples, Afro-descendants, and other subaltern communities, such as the LGBTQ community, became more vocal, and their claims found echo in certain academic circles. Thus, the indigenous post-colonial and decolonial critique exposed the unethical way in which practitioners had behaved in relation to the colonized and, in general, the victims, the subalterns of history. Part of this critique has been accepted by mainstream, by mainstream archaeology and is part of ethical codes, legislations, and institutions. Um, there are some key concepts that deserve closer scrutiny within these uh, post-colonial or indigenous archaeologies, uh, such as reparation, collaboration, ontology, indigeneity, and temporality. Uh, the issue of reparation, about which uh, we have already heard in the previous talk, uh, links with restorative justice and with law. And it has materialized in the return of human remains and objects to the descendant communities. This has led to important debates 
revolving around notions of identity and dissent, among other issues. But here I would rather focus on the uh, other topics that I have mentioned, that is uh, collaboration, ontology, ontology, indigeneity, and temporality. Uh, collaboration is today perceived as, as an ethical mandate that is uh, widely accepted and even enforced in some cases by legislation. Um, so collaboration is not just about collaborating with indigenous peoples, of course, but also with uh, uh, all sorts of publics in uh, former colonial context and also in Europe. However, um, doing collaborative archaeology is not an, an equivocal way to do ethical research. That is, for the fact that you are doing collaborative archaeology, you are not necessarily doing ethical archaeology. Some have voiced concerns that collaboration often boils down to co-optation or public relations. Somebody said it is just being nice to people. And in fact, it may even conceal the structural inequalities and also uh, minimize much needed structural change. So in the case of many uh, uh, indigenous communities, many indigenous minorities, it is less important that they can collaborate in an archaeological project than the fact that they can have access to their own lands or that land is redistributed in a more equal way. The collaborative ethos is often expressed also in paternalistic undertones redolent of the ideology of development. True collaboration, it has been argued, requires the undisciplining of archaeology and a willingness to abandon Western science in certain contexts. Instead, uh, as Cristobal Nieco, a Colombian archaeologist, have uh, remarked, uh, collaborative practice may be a way of masking, of making, sorry, some concessions to circumvent the more onerous uh, ethical demands. So, you collaborate with indigenous communities so that you can actually continue your work as usual. You can continue excavating, doing survey, uh, putting your, the stuff in museums and so on, and you really don't have to, to, uh, to change your practice, your practice that much because supposedly you are doing this in collaboration with indigenous people and you are being ethical. So as opposed to, to these, there are people such as um, um, a Peruvian uh, philosopher called Grosso, uh, who prefer to talk about uh, hospitality rather than collaboration. And he opposes the idea of hospitality in the West, which is very limited when it comes to otherness and how to deal with people that are different, that are radically different. He opposes that to uh, other forms of hospitality that are based on an excess. And it is very typical of Andean societies, but it is actually very typical of uh, pre-modern or non-modern societies all over the world. Uh, so this is a hospitality without boundaries that resonates with some Western philosophy from uh, Jacques Derrida uh, to uh, Alphonse Linges or in Arity. Excessive hospitality implies unrestricted responsibility, boundless generosity, and a total respect for the otherness of the other, which is not something that happens all that frequently uh, in uh, archaeology. Um, the issue of ontology is a very hot topic in, uh, in archaeology and, and anthropology these days. And in the case of, of ethics, this is strongly related to collaboration. The multicultural framework in which indigenous and other collaborative archaeologists are based work with a limited, very limited idea usually of diversity that can be articulated through multivocality, that is, multiple voices different people talking about the same thing from different angles. Um, the problem is that uh, this kind of, of um, multivocality is usually predicated on the idea that people agree on the thing, for example, that the past or the remains of the past are heritage, and they simply disagree into how to approach it. You can use scientific methods like archaeology, or you can use uh, pre-modern or non-modern perspectives, such as myth, for example. The problem is that in many cases, archaeologists and communities will not agree in what the thing is to start with. Um, uh, Alison Wiley, for example, another philosopher, argues that negotiation should begin with a recognition of difference, not the presumption that difference obscures an underlying 
rational universal framework that is neutral with respect to diverse cultural values. Thus, what archaeologists may see as heritage or as archaeological remains, a non-Western community may see as a sacred place or as everyday lived practices. In fact, uh, not respecting this otherness of, of perspectives on the past may lead even to uh, colonial purposes, such as the use of, of the concept of heritage in Palestine by the uh, Israeli government to further disenfranchise the Palestinians. So our radical ethics should be willing to abandon Western uh, conceptual foundations and embrace a form of collaboration based on the notion of the community of those who have nothing in common, as Alphonse Linges has uh, said. Another issue with important ethical and political consequences is the idea of indigeneity. Nielsen Stutz, uh, the Swedish archaeologist, among others, have been critical of embracing notions of indigenous descent as a general ethical rule, and has argued that archaeologists should retain the right to criticize claims to the past by particular groups. Who claims indigeneity is, of course, crucial. In the case of Europe, the concept of being indigenous has served, to, has served very oppressive purposes and has justified the marginalization and even the extermination of uh, minorities such as the gypsies, the Jews, and today of recent immigrants. The presence of large immigrant populations in Europe challenge, in fact, conservative assumptions of aboriginality which have guided archaeology and heritage management until recently. So there are people now that prefer to talk about subaltern or non-dominant rather than indigenous. Generally speaking, however, it is understood that indigenous refers to minority non-Western cultures. The problem is that the concept has uh, a very homogenizing effect. So indigenous societies all over the world uh, look suspiciously similar in the archaeological literature. It does not matter if you're dealing with the San of South Africa, with uh, the Sami in, in Norway, or with the uh, uh, Pueblo peoples in, in Southwest uh, uh, United States. So actually, uh, this uh, homogenization of the indigenous may gloss over local uh, differences, and enforcing local uh, ethical codes that are based on these universal ideas of indigeneity uh, may be uh, counterproductive because, for example, it can ban the display of human remains, which is understandable in the case of settler colonies like Australia or the United States, but it doesn't make that much sense in other places like Sub-Saharan Africa or even the Mediterranean, where the uh, circulation and, ex and, and, and exhibition of bones is not frowned upon. It's actually something that can be even perceived as positive. So the uh, final issue is uh, temporality which uh, is important from an ethical point of view, and it's, it is related, again, with the idea of the indigenous. Um, so the time of non-modern communities is different to modern time because uh, it does not establish a radical divide between the past and the present. This means that moral responsibility is extended not just to the living, but also to the dead. And it could be argued that this is also the case with archaeology. However, uh, ancestors are often mobilized in the present by indigenous communities in ways that are not necessarily respectful uh, to the, uh, what the ancestors believed or, or valued. Uh, for example, uh, another Swedish archaeologist, Svestad, discussing a Sami reburial in Sweden in 2011, which you can see a photograph here, he criticized uh, the uh, indigenous community, the Sami in this case, did not respect the sensibilities of the dead, and that they had manipulated their ancestors uh, for contemporary, in a, with a contemporary uh, political agenda in mind. Uh, for example, these uh, people were buried in a protestant funeral. And the same happens, for example, with the very thorny case of the Holocaust, where you, ha you see uh, uh, modern Jewish communities that try to enforce in the past uh, interpretations of the halacha law that are very restrictive and that probably many of the Jews that were exterminated during the Holocaust would not have liked to be uh, uh, enforced in their case. So uh, a truly archaeological ethic should not make temporal distinctions between past and present, but 
uh, what do we do when present and past concerns are at odds? So just to conclude very briefly, um, the ethical debate is essential in archaeology, but ethics should not be used as a way of policing and disciplining uh, the field. There should be not any kind of practice or group that is off limits from ethical critique. Um, so our desire to help others, advocacy, collaboration, or activism should not be automatically considered as proof of ethical practice and therefore impervious to criticism. In relation to this, there is the risk that moral authority ends up replacing recent arguments. Uh, the field of ethics, like that of politics, is prone to manifestos. This is all right, provided that beyond the calls for action, there are well-worked arguments and not just slogans. Thank you. <laughs>